welcome his midday moments. I'm blessed. I'm better than blessed. Better than blessed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm blessed. I'm better than blessed. Better than blessed. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Welcome this midday moments. I may not have. I may not have. Houses and wealth. I may not have all my strength and health. Welcome, welcome. It's midday moment. Better than blessed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. share with those of you who may be joining us at noon and perhaps there may be some and there will be some who will see this this teaching at a later day but thank you for joining us for a midday and midweek moments here at second Mathis. let me invite you to join me now in a word of prayer as we prepare ourselves to study the word of god God, our Father, we humbly and graciously thank you. You have extended to us another opportunity to dig down into your words, to pour into someone a precept or a principle. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity and this platform that you have given to us that we can present and proclaim your word to people who are distant from us. Lord, we pray in some small way, in some meaningful way, that something will be said today that will speak to someone's heart or speak to where someone may be in life. Lord, we pray for any name that may appear in the comment column, and we pray for any need that may be lifted up. Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise being the gracious God that you are and the gracious God that you have been. Lord, we're going to even thank you for being the God you're going to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome again to our midday moments. I am so delighted to have this privilege to share with you a precept or a principle from the Word of God. As those of you know, my midday moments is the overflow of my eight o'clock time on Wednesday morning with a few of my members. In that eight o'clock moment, I, I share with them a very brief devotion, a very brief devotional and prayer that begins that Wednesday morning. But then I get a chance for midday to take that very brief word that I shared for two minutes and I get a chance for about 30 minutes or more to just explain, expound, and expose you to a broader or a deeper concept of that word. Today, I want to use for the scripture Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 through 26. Listen to what it says. 
Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure. Today, I want to uh, share with you this idea of getting beyond life's if onlys. Getting beyond life's if only. Far too many folks suffer from what I call one of the most contagious diseases of all time. I call it the if only syndrome. If only syndrome. The germs of discontent of this if only syndrome can infect every aspect of your life. It can infect you spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally, as well as, well, psych psychological. It just doesn't infect you, it also affects you. This if only syndrome can infect every aspect of your life and it also can have an affect negatively on your life. Let me just list a few of the if only sickness. If only I had more money. If only we had a nicer or a bigger home. If only I had stayed in that relationship. If only the business had succeeded. If only they had given me a break. If only I had not made that decision. If only people would accept me as I am. If only my folks did not have a divorce. If only I had more friends. If only I was taller. If only I was more attractive. If only I had gone to that school. If only this. If only that. That list can go on and on. If you do not learn to reach a point of genuine contentment with the inner you, you will forever be a victim of this if only syndrome. You have to adopt that passage in Psalms 139, verse 14, where it says, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. You have to adopt that passage in Math, uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 23. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because of his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness woven into the fabric of all those wistful complaints is a sigh I believe rooted in the daily grind of personal discontentment when you are when you are overwhelmed when you allow the if only syndrome to become anchored in you, it may be a real sign that you are rooted in what I call the daily grind of inward and personal discontentment. Taken far enough, the if only syndrome can really become the cause of you really not possessing the inward and the inner contentment that you need. It really does not have any real contentment in yourself. That's, that's what being possessed with this if only syndrome does to you. It allows you not to have real genuine contentment of yourself. It allows you or it robs you of having personal confidence in yourself. In other words, again, you've got to walk that scripture 
by saying, I am fearfully, I am wonderfully made. This if only syndrome robs you of inward and inner contentment and confidence in yourself. Now be clear on what I'm trying to say because true contentment is not having everything but being satisfied with everything you have. I'll say it again. True contentment does not mean that one has everything but true contentment is but being satisfied with everything that you have. Contentment does not mean that you and I do not desire anything else, but it simply means that I have made a conscientious decision to be happy with what I have. Because when we become consumed with the if only syndrome, here are some things I think happens to anybody that find themselves consumed with the if only syndrome. First, we spend too much time looking in life's rearview mirror. When you are overwhelmed, when you are possessed, when your whole life revolves around this if only syndrome, it's a person who's spending too much time looking in life's rearview mirror. You know, the rearview mirror is a small mirror because it's not designed for you to see the wider stuff that's behind you. The windshield, the windshield that's ahead of you, is larger because it wants you to see the bigger road ahead of you. Oftentimes, there are people, I think, who are consumed with the if only syndrome. There are people who spend a whole lot of time looking at life through the rearview mirror. And I'm saying to you, in order not to have the if-only syndrome consuming you, possessing you, grinding you, you've got to learn to look at life not through the rearview mirror, but look at life through the windshield. I'm reminded of the story of a man who had a medical situation he had gone to the specialist, and the specialist discovered what was wrong. And the specialist said that he had to have surgery. And if he could have this surgery, he would be fine. But there was a price that the man had to pay for the surgery. The specialist said, now I can do the surgery, but you got to make a decision. If I do the surgery, you're going to either lose your memory or you're going to lose your sight. But this surgery is going to cause you to either lose your memory or you're going to lose your sight. I can't do the surgery and save both of them. I can do the surgery and only save one. And, and the specialist said, I know this is a big decision. So you go home and you think about it. Pray about it. But remember, if you do this surgery, I can only say one thing. I can't save your memory and save your sight. You're going to lose one of those two. The man went home and thought about it, came back a few days later, and he said, Doc, I made up my mind. I know what I want you to do. I'd rather for you. I'd rather for you to save my sight, and I will lose my memory. The doctor looked at him and said, are you sure that's what you want? He says, yes. I'd rather be you to save my sight than to save my memory. Doc said, fine, okay. He said, but can you tell me why you made that decision? The man said, yes. He said, it's more important to me to be able to see where I'm going than to remember where I've been. May I remind you that sometimes people who are possessed and caught up into the if-only syndrome of life are 
people who spend too much time looking in the rearview mirror light. Look, even God cannot do anything about the past. And God doesn't spend time with the things that did not go well or right in the past. Remember what Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto that man, If you can believe, all things are possible. Let me tell you, if you focus on the present and the future, all things are possible because even you cannot do anything about the past. If God can't do anything about the past, neither can you. Listen, we all have those places where we did not make the best decision. We all have had those moments where we did not say the right thing. We've all had those moments where we should have gone left, but we went right. But we have to choose. We have to choose to live our lives moving forward. There are some things you can only understand about life by looking backward. But you can't live backward you got to live forward. Listen, the past should not be a hitching post, but the past should be a guidepost. You can hitch yourself up to the past and all of your mistakes and all of your misunderstandings, et cetera, et cetera, and you can so easily find yourself just being hitched to life blunders and life burdens of the past until you can't get free from the past. You can find yourself fully and really in a life of discontent because you have given permission for your life to be shackled by the past. You know, the Apostle Paul had a past and Paul says when he writes to the church, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 13, he knew he had a past. He had been a persecutor of the church. He even condoned the stoning of Stephen. Paul says in that letter to the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, he gets down to verse 13. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended of this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. I'm reaching forward to those things that are before me. You cannot be consumed by the mistakes, the misunderstanding, the missteps of the past because you will live your life in this if-only syndrome. So the first thing I said to you, I suggest to you is that people who live with the if-only syndrome and who are possessed by that there are people who spend too much time looking at their lives in the rearview mirror. Secondly, we focus too much on what is missing and not what is present. People who are caught in the grips of the if only syndrome, they're probably people who spend so much time on what is missing in their lives and not what is present. A person that is inwardly discontent will always focus on what is missing because they are busy looking at what others have or what others are doing. A person that is inwardly discontent with themselves and life can have everything in their present and yet miss what they have because they are focusing on what they do not have. Perhaps we need to go back to that old song that we used to sing in the church. When upon life billows, you are tempted and tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Listen to that verse. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings. Money cannot buy. Your reward is in heaven, nor your home on high. I'm telling you that oftentimes we focus, our people focus too much 
on what is missing and not what is present. And when you focus on what is missing, when you focus on what is not there, when you focus on what others have around you, when you focus on that, you miss what is present. And you need to count your blessings one by one. Not count your burdens. Not count your mistakes. Not count what is not there. <laughs> when people are possessed with this if-only syndrome, there are oftentimes people who spend a great deal of their lives looking in the real mirror of life. And people who are possessed with this if-only syndrome there are people who oftentimes are focusing on what's missing and not focusing on what's present. Third, but lastly, people who are possessed or obsessed with the if-only syndrome, they choose to find and look for what is not going well in life or they choose not to see the right things in life. You got to choose to find what is good in life and what you're doing well, what you're doing right. You don't choose or you don't spend time complaining about what is not perfect in your life. Because I need to tell you, there will never be a time or a season in your life where everything will be perfect. I choose to focus on what is good. It may be a small piece, but I've learned to choose what is good. And I've learned to choose and celebrate the small pieces of the good because I keep believing that if I keep celebrating the small pieces of the good things and the right things, they become bigger pieces. When you choose to focus on what is good in your life and what you're doing well or what you're doing right, it's not a way of saying that I'm seeking perfection or you're seeking perfection. It's a way of saying that I am disciplined myself not to allow what may be wrong, what did not go well. I'm not allowing that to have dominance over me. When you choose to see the good things is going right, the right things is going well, it's what I, I, I oftentimes label, it's a disciplined choice. We cannot erase out of our mind the wrong things or the negative things, the missteps. We can't erase that. When Paul talks about forgetting those things that are behind me, he was not saying, I have forgotten them. He's just simply saying, I'm choosing to move forward, and I am forgetting those mistakes, those blunders that I made. Because we have a choice on whether or not we give permission for those missteps, those mistakes, those things that were not good, we have a choice on whether those things dwell in us and build a permanent room in our lives versus whether or not those things are guests in our lives. We have a choice on whether we let those things become visitors in our lives or whether we let those things become permanent residents in our life. You have to choose not to allow the past to come to you with the suitcase and garment bags as if the past pain, injuries, insult, mistakes, missteps are going to stay with you. No, you can't come to me with a garment bag, a suitcase, and a trunk. No. At best, I am choosing to let my mistakes, my missteps, my, my pain, my injuries, I'm choosing 
only to let them come to visit me with the overnight gates. I am not giving permission for those things to dwell. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore choose life. I am choosing life. I'm choosing the life ahead of me. I'm choosing the life before me. I'm choosing the good. I'm choosing the positive. In my office, I have a poster that was given to me by the youth of the church many years ago. I'm in my 20, 20, uh, 30 year here, and I, this probably was over 10, 12 years ago youth at that time that gave me this, these youth are about to graduate from high school. And, but anyway, on that anniversary, that particular anniversary, the youth gave me uh, a poster. And on that poster were things that I as a pastor have been able to do uh, since I've been to church with the support and the cooperation of the members of the church. Now what the youth did not know that on that very year they gave me that, nobody else really knew, I was having some questions about whether or not I was being effective, whether or not I was doing enough. And I, and I, to be very honest about it, I have that question every year, especially on my anniversary, or as I'm leading up to the anniversary. Because I've always said I don't want to ever be sitting in a chair on my anniversary and just actually cannot identify some things that I've tried to do well for the church. But on that particular year, I was having those thoughts in my head about that for me. And when the youth gave me that poster, and it had all these different things that I had been able to do again with the help of the support of the congregation. And here again, that, that probably was 10, 12, 13 years ago. Maybe longer, I don't know. But to this very day, that poster sits in my office. Not in a corner, but it sits right out of my office. And I've had it so long that some of the little paperwork and little carvings, some of it is hanging off, some of it is falling off. But it sits there in my office as a reminder to me personally. Whenever my negative thoughts, whenever my struggles of what I could not do, whenever the missteps or the mistakes decide to come visit me. I walk in that office and I can look at that poster and I see the good things. I see the positive things. I, I see the things that did go well. I see the things that did go right. And for me, that's my moment of encouragement. Because I'm telling you that you have to choose to find and look for the good in life. And you have to choose and look for the thing that went well in life. Because that's an incentive to tell you that something else will go well or go good. Listen, life is too short to be living a life of discontentment. Life is too short to be living a life of uncertainty and living in chaos. Life is too short to be beating yourself up about the past, about your mistakes, about the people who may have been unkind, the people who may have not been sensitive toward you. Life is too short. You have to choose to look for the good things. Look for the right thing. Here again, listen to Proverbs 4 and 25. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Honor the path of your feet. Then all of your ways will be sure. If you're not careful, 
you will give permission for the if only syndrome to fester in you and make you so discontent in life that you will find yourself being incarcerated by the plight and the pain of your past. As a wise man once said, you usually find what you go looking for. I am looking for peace. I am looking for positivity. I'm looking to celebrate the good things. I'm looking for joy. I'm learning to find contentment in who I am in God, and what I am in God, and how God has blessed me. I'm learning to find comfort and acceptance and confidence in life as it is. It's not perfect. It's not without struggles. It's not without some pain. It's not without regrets and remorse. But I'm learning to find contentment in the daily grace of God. I'm learning to find contentment in the mercies of God. I'm learning to find how God meets my need and how God pours mercy and grace upon me. Let me tell you, don't become a victim of the if only syndrome. Stop looking at life in the rearview mirror. Look through the windshield of where you're going. And also, and also, quit focusing on what is missing and see what is present. Choose to look for the good and the things that goes right. And you will win over discontent. Anytime My God has mixed my clouds He mixed my clouds with His bright sunshine So this is a rough and rocky road I'm on I know Thank you for joining me for midday. I pray you've been blessed. I pray I have shared, poured into you some precepts, some principle, something that will raise your head up or pick you up. Hey, listen, you're blessed. I'm blessed. We are better than blessed. I've got God.